You can have a $10 million salary, but if, if you don't believe in yourself and you have no family value, really your net worth is nothing. Hey, welcome friends to another Empire Show. My name is Bedros Koulian and this is an inside look. And today we're gonna to talk about something really awesome. It is gonna be about leadership, but not the type of leadership that takes place on the sports field or in the battlefield, but actually in the business field. And you're gonna see that there's a lot of commonalities across the three fields, sports field, battlefield, and business field. But you're also gonna see that if you're an entrepreneur and you want to lead your business to greater success, there are very specific things you need to do that only, only pertain to business and entrepreneurship. And today, we've got some awesome guests with us. You guys know who they are, Steve Eckhart and Ray Cash Care. They're not only co-instructors with me in the Modern Day Night Project, but we have a separate business together, and that business is LTD, Leadership and Team Development for Corporations, Big Businesses, and for entrepreneurs who want to scale their businesses faster and break through the limiting minutia that is created by ineffective teams through poor communication, poor problem solving, and poor vision building. So with that said, yesterday we did an awesome uh, one-day experience for about 35 CEOs and mm -hmm. founders of 35 different companies. And oftentimes when LTD is doing something like this, it's usually for one company and there'll be the CEO and the second or third in command along with the team, uh, their employees. But this was really cool. We were able to get 35 or so CEOs and leaders together of different companies and really pour into them and show them all the different blind spots that they might have that's limiting the growth of their businesses. Um, just curious, what I wanted to do was bring you guys in here into the studio the following day while everything's still fresh so that we can speak into all of the leaders and CEOs and business founders who listen and watch the Empire Show and really be able to take away a lot of the knowledge and wisdom that we shared there. And so as you guys were interacting with those 35 or so founders and CEOs of big businesses, they were there from real estate to um, uh, marijuana farms, I mean, it was across the board. What were some commonalities, Steve, that you saw in terms of problems or bottlenecks they were having in their businesses? Well, the first thing, it was awesome, the dynamic to get all business owners together. It was a whole different dynamic than when usually when we have all the different rank structures in there. You know, the hourly employees sometimes come with the CEOs. This time it's totally different. So it kind of validified what we're doing, that we were able to impact all these high-level individuals. And there were some very successful business owners there. So that was the awesome uh, dynamic that we never really had before with, with the group. But it seemed the, the common struggle that they're having, especially at that level, is we'd ask them, a, say we ask them a certain question on communication and, yeah. and to rate themselves. They would give themselves a, a 10 or a 9 or an 8 even. But then as we say, wait, I don't want you to rate yourself until I explain how I want you to talk about communication. And we say communicate with your team, with your peers, with your subordinates, with your staff. And they're already start writing, no, 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 don't, don't write down your score yet. What about with your wife, with your spouse, with your community, with your kids, and you'd see their shoulders would sink, mm. they'd scribble out their score, and they'd put a whole different score, and then we would have a, a deep dive discussion to it. So they're focusing on one area and then sacrificing in another area of their life, which that's affecting their business 100%. So yeah. it was a huge dynamic to get in the, the personal side, the family side, connected with the business side. Yeah, that, that's a really good observation because I was talking to a gentleman who owns um, a big financial fund that he raises for apartments outside during that lunch break that they had. And uh, he mentioned that piece and he said, I realize that everything that I dropped the ball on, on my family, in terms of communication and leading my family, bleeds into my business. Mm -hmm. And I was like, are you saying that how you do anything is how you do everything? And he goes, yes, exactly. And that is very true. Like anything we do from our, the way we, our headspace, our emotional space, our physical health, the way we communicate with friends and family uh, bleeds into our business because you can't go, well, I'm going to be a great communicator in business, but then I'm just going to be a lousy and emotionally constipated communicator with friends and family. Mm -hmm. those, those things don't make sense. They had, they had some breakthroughs on it because even on the family, we had them score themselves on family. Then, even then, they're putting eight or nine and then mm -hmm. you say, 
Well, they think it's an eight or nine because, oh, I'm providing for my family. There's a lot more to, to your family than just fucking providing for your family. There's how many experiences are you actually creating? How many times are you sitting down and being present with them and intentional about the activities you're doing with them? And then again, crossing out the scores, their, their mindsets were almost yeah. warped because they're such high, high performing individuals that in business that it just, they thought they were all in this one area and then yeah. they had to be. So that's an interesting thing because you could be a high performer in business but be unsuccessful in life. Mm. And at the end of the day, if we're trying to become successful people, not just successful in business, but successful in life, then you've dropped the ball if you're, let's say, making millions, absolutely profitable, your company's hitting the Inc. 500 list one year after a year. That happened to me, by the way. Uh, year 2014, 15, and 16, yet I felt like I was completely dropping the ball on the other side. And there is a sense of balance that has to happen, and it's easy enough to do. Um, shifting gears, obviously both of you were in the military um, as a Marine and a Navy SEAL. I'm curious, Ray, maybe you can lead off on this. <clears throat> Leadership in battle. Mm -hmm. How does, what makes a great leader on the battlefield? I'd like to hear from you first. Yeah, so uh, traits of a great battlefield leader is someone who leads by example. Um, I, they have to step up and they are setting the tone for the men or women, wherever that battle may be. Um, they're also amazing listeners. Some of the best battlefield team leaders I've worked for will listen to their troops 24 seven and they will take that information in and then it's up to that leader to decide what they're gonna do with it. <clears throat> and a great battlefield leader is humble and he's three dimensional. We've been talking about it all day, right? You said, you know, a lot of these leaders that I see, just because this is the way it's been done means it's the right way. Great battlefield leaders are three dimensional. They think outside the box and they learn from their mistakes. And that is a trait that is dying these days because mm -hmm. so many individuals, just like on the battlefield and as they grow through the corporate level, that ego gets in the way and they think they get, they get the blinders on. And, and that's what we showed them yesterday is that <laughs> there are so many different ways to skin a cat. And Steve hit it right on the head. First thing we ask is, how's your life? Well, I make a gazillion dollars. That's one dimensional. Battlefield, business field, home field, right? The battlefield is the internal struggle. The business field is at work, that's great. And then the home field is, how's the home life? And every single time Steve and I do these, these courses, we speak, we speak to thousands of people, they all, all these CEOs say the same thing. What do you mean? This is a business seminar. No, this is a life seminar. That's the difference. That's what we're bringing. That's what great leaders do. They implement everything that they've learned in all three battlefields of their lives and they incorporate it to whatever that current battle is they're mm -hmm. doing. Mm -hmm. Steve, how about you? What, what, what's a, what, what, what makes, what are the inherent traits of a strong battlefield leader? We could say the things like decisiveness and being able to make instantaneous decisions. And as Ray said, to learn from their mistakes. That's really what decisiveness is. How do you get, you can't say, all right, be decisive. How do you get decisive? By learning from mistakes, as Ray said. How do you learn from mistakes? By taking risks, making bold moves, taking action, putting yourself in the fight and making mistakes, fucking, fucking up, failing sometimes. And what, is, what does it take, really? The overarching is just courage. If you think courage, that's what decisiveness is, is to have the courage to jump in. How do you make a quick decision? You can't do it without courage. I think courage is probably the overarching thing, especially when you're talking about the battlefield, but mm -hmm. transfers very easily over into the business. Yeah, yeah, well said. In fact, during the business um, segment of it, when I, when I came downstairs to, to speak into these uh, 35 or so leaders, um, it, 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 was, it was pretty neat to see that by that point, I think it was like maybe a couple hours in, you guys had already worked with them, they had a greater understanding, for example, of listening versus hearing, mm. right? Listening is understanding what the person across from you is saying. Hearing is you hear words, but you're just waiting to talk. Mm. And so I was guilty of this long ago. Um, look, in the battlefield, if you're not listening, you're just hearing, mm -hmm. it could cost you your life, I imagine. I've never been in battle, I've never been in the military, but I could only imagine that. And in the business field, it can cost you market share, it can cost you a ton of money, it could cost you broken relationships with vendors or business partners or great opportunities. Mm -hmm. And here's an example, many, many years ago, I felt like, I think this is an example of someone who's 
new into entrepreneurship, when I say new, within your first five or six years, you're still a puppy as an entrepreneur mm -hmm. and as a, as a business leader. And you think that you're supposed to have the answers to everything, the answers to what should the product cost, what should the web page look like, uh, how should we structure the pay structure for our employees. And you think that you're supposed to have all the answers to the problems. Uh, in fact, I learned long ago that all I know is what I know, yet I've got a team of 20, 30, 40, 50 people across from me who work with me, <clears throat> and I've yet to ask their opinion. And a great example was shown to me a couple years ago, uh, Lauren from upstairs, she had just taken upon herself to start marketing the Fit Body Bootcamp locations on Pinterest. Um, she had gotten permission from our VP Bryce to start marketing Fit Body Bootcamp franchise locations on Pinterest. And we were getting 4x the return versus on Facebook. So on Facebook, for every dollar we spent, we got $2 back. On Pinterest, for every dollar we spent, we got $4 back. Now, had they come to a L10 meeting with me, a level 10 meeting with me, leadership meeting, and pitched me on the idea of marketing on Pinterest, let's say eight years ago, the old me, I would've been like, that guy's stupid. All Pinterest has is like pictures of cakes and outfits for kids and all this stuff, right? The new me is like, listen, you're always gonna have a budget to play with, to go and explore with. And I want you to test with it and come and tell me the outcome. By listening to my team, who's actively engaged in different social media plat platforms, who's actively engaged in the cultures that exist out there, they were able to get us Forex to return on every dollar through Pinterest, but if you had asked me, I would have been hesitant to try Pinterest at the time. So it's a great example of the old me wouldn't have listened and would have said that's a waste of time, just divert the rest of that money here on Facebook or YouTube where we really monetize well. And so uh, with that said, what do you guys see is, what do you see that the best leaders do well that ineffective leaders don't, Steve? I think the first thing is they, well, first you, did, you said is they subdue their ego a little bit. They realize they don't have all the answers and they, even if they might know the answer is not give the answer right away because then they're doing a disservice to that person right there. They're not developing that person. So oh. same as in the military is developing future leaders. That's a force multiplier. That's what allows you to then have that, that speed of action and violence of action right off the bat is if you're developing other leaders, you don't have to do everything yourself. If you have to go up the chain of command for every answer and then wait till it comes back down to you, by the time you did that, you're overrun by the enemy. Now, if you have a force that at any level, has, they know their authority of, of delegation that they can do because they, they've been trained and taught that way and they can make a decision like that, they could overwhelm that much larger force. Mm -hmm. Same thing in business, the same way. So it's really developing future leaders, I think is, is the number one thing they do differently. And that takes them to subdue their ego because they think they could do everything better than everyone. And they, and, they probably could do most things better than everyone, but I'm guessing you can't run a Facebook ad better than the Facebook ad people, nope. right? Pretty nope. sure you'd, not, you'd suck at it compared to going on the computer yeah. and doing all that stuff. So it's to say, all right, I, you could go figure it out and you could do it yourself if you want to, and it, you might do a decent job at it, but to say, all right, I'm gonna find someone who can even do this better than me, that, that takes a big hit to some people's ego because they're the, they probably start off by themselves doing everything alone to start handing off, off that stuff to, to delegate so that they can elevate, and that's, that's the only way it's gonna happen. That's a really good observation. And if we know that the things that winning founders, CEOs, and leaders do, who are winners, are to delegate and empower and build other decisive leaders, why aren't more of them doing that? I think because of that, they don't wanna give up power. They don't wanna give up control. They think they're gonna lose money and it, it comes, comes back to a foundation of not having enough trust when we can say what makes a good team we can say trust makes a good team but really what makes a good team is is the good leader because he's the one that's going to develop trust amongst the team so they can't say all right we're stuck in these different silos we're, we're stuck on the and all uh, adversarial uh, uh, the leader is going to make them think it's us versus them not us versus them you know yeah. what i mean that's yeah. that's what a leader's gonna do is pull yeah. them together in that same way yeah that's a really good observation ray what makes a good team like if if someone is starting out in business and they're reaching that point where they're like man it's just me and my wife right now but i think we need to start really doubling down on ourselves we want to start mm -hmm. hiring people yep uh, 
listen, when I started, I would hire someone and I would say, this is your job, not explaining what the entire mission of our business mm -hmm. is, just this is your job. Yep. And I felt like they were working in a silo, then I'd get upset at them when they wouldn't do their job right. So what makes a good team as you begin to scale and hire employees? Well, obviously, first thing you need to understand is what I feel the acronym of a team really is, and that is trust, effort, attitude, and mission, right? Whether you're the CEO or you're the first guy, on, the newest guy on the ground, you've got to understand that. It starts with this. You have to trust yourself, trust in the mission, trust in the vision, right? So you need to make sure that that message, whatever it is you want as a leader, is coming across to even if it's your wife and your employees. Effort, um, a good leader does not have employees that work for them, he work, they work with them. So how do you do that? I don't believe, and a good leader doesn't believe in giving, I don't want 100% of what you got, I want everything you've got, right? Um, attitude, it's as simple as this. You have to show up every day with a great attitude. You told me once that nothing will open and close a door faster in this life than a good or bad attitude. Mm -hmm. If you have someone with a bad attitude, it's contagious, it's a cancer, it needs to go away. And then M, as a good leader, there needs to, you need to be, to be a great leader, you have to be a master communicator. And the mission has to be embedded in everyone's DNA. And that's whether it's physical, mental, emotional, social, spiritual, and financial, whatever your mission is, your team needs to understand that. Your team needs to understand that you have core values. If you don't have core values, if you don't have principles, um, then you're not gonna develop the right team because you're gonna have a bunch of individuals that are doing their own thing, yeah. right? Uh, leaders, they choose, right? In the business world, hire, sl uh, hire slow, fire fast. Well, guess what? We have the same thing in the SEAL teams. There is a process to become a Navy SEAL, right? We weed out the weak and then we weed out the strong. I only want the best on my team. And when everybody comes on my team, they know exactly what my vision, my mission, my values, and my views are 24 seven. And a great leader will do what we do in the SEAL teams. They will have what we call, and I'm using these acronyms, AARs, after action reports. I believe in having them weekly, monthly, annually. If something changes with you, if you, because you're, you're ahead of the game, these leaders are seeing other things that maybe I'm not, we need to be informed of what's going on. So the communication, the transmitting and receiving, that is what's key. The best leaders I have ever worked for, worked with, have been amazing communicators. I know what, what's going on at all times, right? Yeah. And that's how it works. They, they tell me what they know, what they don't know, and when they will know it. There's no time um, for deceitfulness in, in a company, in life, or in your team. Yeah, true enough, true enough. Let, let's talk about as you build that team. I mean, you, you said something, you said, you know, trust, effort, attitude and mission. Yes, sir. Get it. And then of course I talked about the vision. And mm -hmm. in fact, I remember asking the lady up front and I'm not here to pick on her, so I'm not going to say, call her name out. But I said, uh, you know, we saw her name and then she was a CEO of a, uh, of a, a pharmaceutical grade marijuana hemp mm -hmm. manufacturing company. And I said, Hey, what is your goal of your company? She said, I don't know if you guys remember she said, to change, mm -hmm. change the world. I was like, Oh, cool. Cool. By when? She's like, as soon as possible. Like, well, there's like a whole bunch of people in the world, right? And so she realized very quickly, well, our goal is, I said, can you be more specific to change the lives of 100 million people? Okay. Still as soon as possible? I go, because if I work for you as soon as possible, it might be in five years. Like 100 million lives changed to me is five years from now. This guy might think 100 million lives changed might be a year from now. You as the founder, 100 million lives changed might be three years from now. So we have three very different views and the leader is not aligned with the two employees. She's like, dude, you're right. And so I gave the example of when I first started Fit Body Bootcamp, anyone would ask me like, what's your goal of Fit Body Bootcamp? We're gonna have a bunch of locations all over the world as soon as possible. Like that was not a clear vision for my team members. At the time I had about eight, nine team members. And therefore I was constantly frustrated with my team. Today we've got over 50 people in the building here and everyone knows that our goal is 2000 locations by the year 2025. And that means if that's our vision and a vision is always about what you want, when do you want it and why, the why piece. And as I shared that with them, I just saw so many people writing that note down because your team, your employees at the end of the day have to buy into the why. The why for Fit Body Bootcamp is 
that we want to have six million people every morning working out at a Fit Body Bootcamp location and changing their lives through workouts, nutrition, and a positive mental attitude. Mm -hmm. And so now if I'm looking for new employees to hire, I go, hey, here's our vision statement. Our vision statement is we want 2,000 Fit Body Bootcamp locations by the year 2025 because we believe when we have that, we'll be changing, impacting six million lives every single morning through fitness, nutrition, and a positive mental attitude. Now, if someone's like, that doesn't interest me, dude, don't get on board on my company because you're just not gonna work mm -hmm. as a team member. You're gonna work as an employee. And then we defined what an employee was, which is an employee clocks in a little late, clocks out a little early, and does the bare minimum to maintain employment. Mm -hmm. Whereas a team member knows what the mission is, and plays ferociously with the other team members to win. Like that's a very big difference. And so anyway, she had that aha moment and I could see how everybody was writing down their vision of obviously what they want, when they want, and why they want it. And then I said, when you have that vision, it speaks to the M in team, which is the mission, their daily mission. Like we know we need uh, 34 EOIs in to this building every day, expression of interest forms, applications in for potential franchisees to hit our goal. So if we're not getting 34 applications a day, we're behind schedule. Mm. And so all of a sudden they were like, holy crap, I get it. You can take your big vision and break it down into little edible chunks on a daily basis. Yes. And now that makes it more tolerable. And so that said, we talked about attitude and listen, we've all done it. We've hired people, they come in with great attitude or they interview well with great attitude, but then you realize very quickly they tank or They've been awesome in terms of great attitude, but all of a sudden there's a shift in their attitude or their demeanor and they're no longer a good fit. Mm -hmm. How do we deal with people in a business, as entrepreneurs, with people that have this, they were once a good fit and now they're not? I think sometimes it has to do with the leader, right? The leader comes to the workshops like, like they came to yesterday. If those leaders go back to their teams and don't take all that information and install and download it into their teams, they're gonna keep leveling up. It's like a marriage, right? If you level up and, and your partner doesn't, mm -hmm. there's too big of a slope in there, they can't keep up. They need to take them along for the ride. So I think they develop, they'll read the personal development books, they do all, they get the coaches, they do all this other stuff, but maybe then don't pour it into their team. They're just holding all that information and knowledge and wisdom hostage in their head and the team's getting left behind. So I, you still, like, like we always say, take accountability. How, always look at the situation. How can you blame yourself? How can you blame the leader? What could the leader have done better? That's not always gonna be the answer. I think that's one of the first answers. This next thing would probably be building personal relationships with them, getting to know your people, know what, what are their goals, what are their hobbies, interests, what are they looking to achieve in life, and how can you help them get that through the, through the career that they're in now? How can those be combined and put together in that person's goal? And then I think the third piece is letting them know how their piece, their job, no matter how small they think their role is, how does it fit? That big vision, that last part of the vision that you said, that's way up here, that higher calling. How does that, all right, I'm going on this website and I'm doing this email and I'm editing stuff on an email all day, it's, it's boring. No, because, and you, you tr retrace the steps, how does it lead to that big picture? How does every single role fit into the big picture yeah. of what the vision is? Yeah, that's huge. You know, I wanna add on that, uh, something I say in one of my presentations is the more you know, the more you'll grow, right? Developing, a great leader develops great corporate culture, right? We talk about having um, that open door policy and you know as well as I do, you run a huge company. And you can say that and you're a very personable person, but if I'm new, I am not gonna go up to the CEO of $200 million company and say, sir, I have a problem going on. So there needs to be SOP, standard operating procedures, procedures and rules that are put in place because if I see somebody, like if Steve is working and he is a eight cylinder machine, he's always grinding, and all of, a sudden, all of a sudden something's off, I hope we've developed that type of relationship because as a good leader, I'm investing in my troops and my teams on the battlefield, which is at work and then off, right? Doing activities together so we get to know each other and then as we get to know a, a more about each other, we get more comfortable, right? You and I have developed a relationship. I've talked to you offline about so, some things that most employees would not talk to with giant CEOs, but we've de developed that relationship. Now, there's a, there should be a chain of command. People work for people, and, w and it's not just your job. It's not just the CEO's job to know every single person's roles and, and types of, of their, their behaviors. It's the people that you put under you. Everybody should know everybody's position. In the SEAL team, when you're in a, when you're in a patrol, you know the guy in front and the guy in behind, behind you's position. Same thing in the Marines. So the more you know about people, and that's why, you know, I know you're real big on that, doing the off-site activities, 
people get comfortable with each other. So if I'm more comfortable with Steve, I could come to him and say, and I see something's off. Hey, Steve, you got a second? Yeah, I noticed you've been off a little bit. Hey, is everything good with the family, the fitness, the finances, and faith, right? We break it down. Yeah. Then, right, because that's my four non-negotiables. But then, if it's not that, hey, maybe it's at work. Is it, is it a teamwork problem-solving leadership and communication problem that you're having with someone? And you, as either a CEO or a manager or just a, a peer, can dissect that problem in minutes as long as you have that cor corporate culture and that relationship with somebody, yeah. right? And that's how you get things solved, right? Problem makers, problem solvers. That is problem solving so that the machine, the big machine, the Fit Body Bootcamp, the LTD can keep moving. That's, that's a really great way to break it down because we, you know, I drew the trust pyramid on the, mm, yeah. on the marker board yesterday. If you draw a pyramid and you stack three words in it, uh, four words in it, um, the foundation word at the very bottom of that pyramid is trust. When a company has trust, then they feel they're safe. They don't feel like the threat that, like, gosh, if I'm working for Steve and I, I don't trust him because he's proven to me that he's erratic in his emotions, if I don't have trust, I'm not going to have the next step, which is conflict, healthy conflict. Mm -hmm. In all business, there should be healthy conflict. If you're a leader and you find everybody just says, yes, sir, yes, ma'am, and they're all just yes people and not pushing back and giving you some conflict and not challenging you, there's probably a trust issue. Mm -hmm. The foundation is trust, and then you have, if you have trust, you will have conflict, healthy conflict. If you have healthy conflict, that means you have good communication. You have good communication, there's problem solving, and problem solving is what leads to results, the fourth thing at the top of the pyramid. But at some point, as you said, if you don't have that interpersonal relationship with people, you haven't invested mm -hmm. in them by working out with them breaking bread with them, like I, I take some team members, we go out surfing, others we go shooting guns with, others we work out with, some Tuesday nights we roll at the gym, and others who aren't into any of that stuff, I'll go have coffee with on a weekend morning before I go to the gym, and it's just a little bit of time of getting to know them well ahead of any problem coming up, because I realize we're all human, some problem's going to come up. And if I need to speak to them, or if any of my other leaders need to speak to them, they've built that level of relationship. And they can go to them and be like, hey, bro, what's up? What's happening in those four areas of your life, for faith, fitness, family, finance, or in the business uh, area, which is you know the problem solving, the teamwork, communication, and be able to dissect it and break it down. But if you don't have that relationship, you haven't built it ahead of time, now you're going to be like, I'm just going to have to write you up. And it's so easy to write people up mm -hmm. and then fire them but you don't know who you're gonna get next, if they're gonna be any better, any mm -hmm. worse. So with that said, that is a role of the leader, is to at least build a relationship with their key people, and those key people, the second in commands, can build relationships with the folks in, who are in the rank and file so that that open communication happens. But I'm gonna ask you guys this, when's the right time to fire someone? I think once you've once you feel like you've done your due diligence, like I said, when you leveled up and didn't take, if you know you've taken them along for the ride, you've poured into them, you've done the things that you're talking about, you've done all this stuff and they still don't, they just don't get it. It's not clicking. That either, they either don't like what they're doing or they're not good at what they're doing. One of those two, either one of those two reasons, they could be, they could be gone, really. Mm -hmm. if, they, if they don't like it or they're not good at it. If both of those aren't happening, pretty much that, that's a sign right there. It's an easy barometer. Or you can even say uh, other, you could see little grids and other charts that say, all right, they have the skills and are they a skill fit or are they a culture fit? If they have the skills, but they're not fitting the culture, that tells you right off the bat, like you're not, a lot of times that's not going to be a good fit. You've already done, if you know you've done the due diligence. Now, if you've been a shitty leader for all this time and you set those standards and didn't live the standards and didn't enforce the standards, you let shit slide for so long, then it's up to you to try and redo that work that you did. That was your fault. But if you know you've done the due diligence, you set the standard, you live the standard, you enforce the standard, and it's just not working. It's either if move them to a different position, coach them up. If you know you tried all that, then it, it's probably, I'd rather, when it comes down to it, I'd rather have an empty seat than a pile of shit sitting in a seat warming yeah. it up. Yeah, because that person's toxic and contagious and they will get everybody else around them equally as toxic. Um, to wrap this up, let me ask you, both of you, and Ray, you can kick it off first, culture. How important is culture in a business or a company establishment? I feel uh, culture is one of the key foundations um, that it starts with, just like in the SEAL teams or, like I said, the battlefield. You have to have that camaraderie, right? Camaraderie is key. There has to be, and there has to be, um, 
competitive rivalry within mm -hmm. the group, right? You want overachievers. So that's where it starts. That is key, it's, it's foundation. And what happens is, is when you get a pool of just you know, overachievers, and because again, you told me before, remember? Trust, effort, attitude, mission. This was when you hired me. I will hire you for effort and attitude. Time, uh, trust takes time, and I will, I will teach you the mission. So if you have those two, those two key components and you apply that, the rest will come as long as they are on board with what you want. And I love it, and I see it all the time. We're seeing it. And what's so amazing is we do these groups like yesterday, and these questions that you're asking us, we say this to the CEOs of the company, and they're, they're just like this. And then what we do is you get up there, and we just open this up, and they're like, oh, my God, there's, there's more to being a successful entrepreneur than just making money, yeah. right? You said as well as I did, you can have a $10 million salary, but if, if you don't believe in yourself and you have no family value, really your net worth is nothing. Yeah. So what we're doing here and what you do is we try to implement what's really important, right? You are more than what you are at work. There's overlapping fields of fire. There, You are a three-dimensional human being. Bringing your A game means every day to work, usually to me means you have balance in the outside world, your life with your family and with yourself. Yeah, well said. Culture. Yeah, I think it, it comes down to, we hear, we hear the term, don't give a shit what anyone thinks about you, right? And that's fine, but I think what a culture is, is knowing the difference of who to give a shit, what to think about you and who not to give a shit. Yeah. I give a shit what people like you think about me. That's not being approval seeking or groveling, that's what I think is culture. That's, mm -hmm. I don't wanna let either one of you down. <coughs> Excuse me. And you, when you're with the team, you, you, like Ray talks about all the time, he, he could have his, his SEAL platoon way out in the distance. He could see exactly who they are just by their movements because they've built that, that culture. They've gotten to know each other so well. I always know it's Ray because it's very, it's very short. So I know there's Ray right there. <laughs> had, to, had to throw that in there. This was getting too serious of a show for me. Damn. So And that's how we that's know sorry. there's Ray. <laughs> Let's <laughs> try to be serious on this one, go ahead. It's getting too serious for me, we have to lay now. I love it, go on. But is, is that culture of, all right, I don't want to let people down. You want people on your team who would feel like they failed just for letting you down. Not mm. fail because they didn't make money or did, just because they let you down. That's the type of culture, I think, and that's how you determine who should I give a fuck what they think about me and who shouldn't I. I think that's a skill and that's a culture in itself, I think. Yeah. Yeah. And, well, yeah, I'm right. sorry, I got to, and when you have good corporate culture like we do, like you've never, I've messed up many a times with both of you, I have. I've been harder on myself than you guys have been on me because I believe in the corporate culture, I believe in the brotherhood, sisterhood of what we stand for because that's what's key is, especially you know when you have that corporate culture, you wanna show up every day and give your, your maximum worth, your effort um, into it. And what, what I've noticed is, is I've seen, since I've been here with you for three years, people have come and they've gone. I've seen people rise, I've seen people fall. And it, what I'm learning is, is I try to surround myself with the people that are climbing up that and finding out what they're doing. And the one key thing is, is there's that corporate culture. They believe in what you're doing and they're not just coming here. This is the key, they're not just coming to punch their time card and work, you know? Steve and I, we have competitions. I took four calls on Christmas day because I believe in what we're doing here, mm -hmm. because we are changing lives, one human and one business at a time. Yeah, yeah, that's huge. And you know, it's funny you say that because here at HQ, we've gone, we've had bad culture. <coughs> and I, when I think back, bad culture has stemmed from me. We've had great culture and it stemmed from me again. Because when we had bad culture, I was living incongruently to the leader, the CEO that I wanted to be. And so as I was sharing yesterday that guys, if you're living incongruently, in other words, if you expect your team to wake up early and be squared away and show up on time or early and, and, and do their job, well then you better be squared away. And if you're not, you're subconsciously, there's that whisper back there that says, hey, you're an imposter, you're a hypocrite. You, you are asking for something that you're not doing yourself and you're living incongruently. And that was me. And, and you say this all the time in the project. I know we're not talking about the project right now, but you sh say this all the time in the project. Rip you your say, face off your fucking face? <laughs> no. You also say that, <laughs> which we do need to address for a moment. Yeah, one of my favorite lines. Uh, 
is when Steve says, I'm gonna rip your face off your fucking face. And it's deep, it's deep. And the guys don't know what to think because they wanna laugh, because it's funny, but if they laugh, they're gonna get punished gonna more. <laughs> and then when I ask them, why don't you laugh? They feel like they did something wrong and they end up getting punished anyway. So it's a no-win where the project is concerned. But going back to this, the thing you share at the project that's worth sharing here with this audience in terms of entrepreneurial success is that if you're living incongruently, you say, hey, I could be on the other side of the country and I could do something low down and dirty and I could get home and my kids will never, would never know. But somehow through the universe, they'll find out and through karmic justice, it'll impact them. You, you said in a more eloquent way. Um, you just call me eloquent. That, yeah, yeah, wow. of all things. Sure, but, the first. Fuck. Yeah, oh, yeah. right? So, but, but I think there's a lot of truth to that because when you're a incongruent leader and you feel like you're a hypocrite, an imposter, you, you hit the snooze button, you didn't wake up on time, you said you were gonna go work out and you didn't, you said you were gonna send out your broadcast to your affiliates and you didn't, and then you expect out of your team, your subconscious mind is calling you an imposter, a hypocrite, and that you're not gonna do it, and that bleeds into a shitty culture. Mm -hmm. On the flip side, when I started to do everything that I said I was gonna do, I checked off every box every morning, non-negotiable, like they could feel that energy, mm -hmm. like this cat lives what he like preaches, and I need to either fall in line or I need to fall out. And that's how the culture changed because once I started living and breathing the core values that I really believed in, but was kind of waffling on back then, as soon as I locked that in, man, and became a robot, if you will, um, we lost, I think, a total of six people in a one-year period who were just like, oh, he's not gonna waffle back to that loser of a leader. He's like, this guy's fully committed now. Bye. Uh, yeah. And, and they didn't know what you were doing in the morning. You were doing, yeah. you, they didn't know you were right. waking up early. It's just yeah. they, somehow, your aura, yeah. the universe yeah. told them. Mm -hmm. I, I took a course of Martin Rooney's like 20 years ago and he calls it, he, it's for personal trainers. It's in the fitness industry. He just calls it personal trainers eat your broccoli. Meaning don't fucking tell your clients go eat their broccoli if you're not eating your broccoli yeah. yourself. Then you're gonna wonder, why your clients aren't getting results, why you're not making any money, because you didn't eat your fucking broccoli. You're telling them to do one thing, you're doing another. You're telling them to drink water, a gallon of water, and you're not doing it. You're telling them to go to sleep, and you're not doing it. It's the same thing, eat your, eat your fucking broccoli. Amen, mm -hmm. well said to that. All right, last question. This is, I, I hear this often because when I start talking about <clears throat> LTD, like, hey, if you're a business, you have a team of employees, you wanna work more efficiently, you want that team to be able to, to communicate well, to be able to problem solve, and to be able to be in line with your vision, or if you're a leader and you're just like, my vision is unclear, so I don't know how to communicate that to my team, then I always go, then you need to bring an LTD into your workplace and let us bring your team together and kind of air out the problems, work through the frustrations, and then help you become a team that knows how to lead and communicate and problem solve and, and really work to win. The thing that I hear whenever I talk about that on social media and my stories is, uh, are those guys gonna like treat us like we're at the project? Mm -hmm. And so what do you guys say to that? Abso-freaking-lutely. <laughs> we're gonna be through the ass. mud. <laughs> There's gonna be all kinds of torture chambers. No, it's getting a lot of the same similar takeaways, but it's for the corporate world, for your team. It's, yeah. it's getting this really, this really the same takeaway of, all right, work-life work, work -life balance is bullshit. Work, who, I don't wanna be balancing work. I don't wanna be balancing my life. I wanna be fucking awesome in both. So we're gonna, what LTD comes in is takes your team and we teach them work-life, you can call it work-life synergy or work-life satisfaction, work-life domination, work-life discipline, or even just work-life freaking happiness because that's what it turns out mm -hmm. to be. It's such a blend of the two every time. Anyone, could, we, we can't go in there to a real estate place and tell them how to sell a house better. There's, they already know, that, that was that entry just to get to the position they're in. But we can teach them how to have that work-life synergy that's gonna make them make a shitload more money in, yeah. in, the long, in the long run. So that's really what we do when we come in. Yeah. So obviously at LTD, what you guys do, and if they pay a little more, they get me along with you guys yeah. as well, is um, there's the one day and the two day experience. Ray, yes. talk us through what a one day experience looks like for like yesterday for well, a group of entrepreneurs. Well, a, a one business. day experience starts a few weeks ahead of time when Steve and I take the time to send out a questionnaire. So we wanna know from you what's going on with your company and Steve puts out this amazing questionnaire so we can gather intel and then crunch it and then know where the problem areas are versus just showing up and teaching, right? So the difference between this and any other course is this is not a cookie cutter program. We specifically design it for each CEO. There's no two CEOs on this planet. So once we figure out the information that we need, we come in there 
and we incorporate and we infuse with any company the teamwork, problem solving, leadership, communication, and then we use what I like to call our three-dimensional uh, system where we show the individuals where you might be excelling at one thing, you're not at the other. And what's so amazing about yesterday, you know, we started off in the morning. Um, we do an, we do some hands-on experience. I don't want to I don't want to tell everybody what we're doing, but okay, for, but let's talk about that for a moment. Yeah. What, what took place the first hour? First was, hour was it hands-on or was it seated? First Pugil hour, sticks, fight to the death. <laughs> first two hour, what I did is I take the individuals outside and I do a communication drill with them. I take about twenty individuals. And then what I do is I have them try to transmit and receive. It's a drill that we do. Not only I gave them five words, not only do these CEOs, 30 CEOs of these giant corporations get it wrong, they only had one of the words correct. So right there, we then go inside, and remember that was the problem, then we solve it with breaking down the styles and types of communication. And then after that, Steve, what was the course you did yesterday after I did my communication course? You did a... No, it was Bedros. You came in, sorry, yeah. and you taught about an hour of business, which yeah. is amazing, right? At a yeah. whole different level. Steve put it. Uh, we do. Uh, I then taught about team. I broke down the analogy of team. Uh, Steve does an amazing emotional discipline um, course that, Lily, if you haven't heard, it's amazing about the three colors that men and women live in. Uh, what else did you do, Steve? You do another course. What was the other one? The, the work-life balance. The work-life work balance life and the one scheduling thing, the time yeah, and the one thing that Steve breaks out that I think is the biggest, I'm going to steal your thunder, is everybody in business, just like me, ha, I'm going to use it, sorry, has a calendar. And they have a calendar for everything they do. And Steve comes in every time, I got goosebumps, and he says, show me the calendar for your family. And not one fucking person has one. I was guilty of it. He teaches you how to develop and create mm -hmm. balance, yeah. right, in your life. And every single person, yesterday you were there, how many people are guilty, I'm going to give you credit, I don't do it often, of not having a calendar for your person? Every hand went up. Yeah. And when we do this, you actually see the light bulb come on. People sit up, their posture's better, and they're like, holy shit, let's hang on. This is going to be a great ride. We have done courses where people have been emotional and cried. And the one thing that we do, whether, and we do that in the one day, the two day course, we get much more involved. But what we do that no other company does also is we want to do follow ups with companies. We'll do virtual. We follow up. We did, we've done this for many, many companies. We want to see how you're progressing. No one else is doing this. Usually when it's done, bye. We don't want that. Let's check in with you one, three, and six months in a year from now. Let's come back out and tweak you back in and bring Bedros and make you better. That's what we're doing. No one else is doing this out there. Well, that's good to know because again, oftentimes I'll hear from people that say, gosh, you know, I know Ray and Steve bring the thunder at the project. Mm -hmm. And so I certainly don't want, and, you know, we put the videos out of the project, but just want to get the clarity that almost 90% of LTD, when you guys come in and, and do the leadership and team development, it's really about working with their teams in a seated uh, kind of almost school environment, educating them, and then putting them through some drills outdoors, either in a local park or just moving the chairs and tables away and doing some communication drills and, and drills where they actually have to work hand in hand together to solve a problem. And I'll finish it off by doing saying this. Um, when we first launched LTD, if you remember, we did it for my staff here for HQ. And then I had Joan send out a survey to my whole staff, just like, hey guys, give us feedback on what you thought of this. You know, because first impression, especially with the two of you, it's like, oh man, they're you know rough exterior, they're very scary, they're very intimidating, is what I thought I was getting, and then I was so impressed with those drills they put us through, and when the questions kept unfolding, that how do you feel about the workplace environment now? Someone said, I know we were never like coworkers and employees here at HQ. I always felt like we're team members. And I kept seeing the word, but now I feel like we're family. Mm. And so some of those people I went to and I talked to personally, I was like, tell me why you think we're family. One person said it best, Jamie, she said, uh, I had never had physical contact with another one of my team members. Like, you know, one of those drills, now we wanna, wanna give away the drills, but mm. it's a little problem solving drill where it takes two or three people to solve this problem together. They have to kind of, you know, link up arms together to solve this problem. And when you're all of a sudden 
having physical contact with someone and and using your bodies to solve a problem very quickly and then you're high-fiving no work environment creates that opportunity so you want to take your team your people from employees to team members to family members because family never lets family down now that was my biggest getaway or takeaway from from the ltd training that took place here for hq um, so with that said, how can people learn more about LTD and reach out to you guys, connect with you guys to see which LTD program is best for them? Sure. On, of course, on social medias, LTD Training is on Instagram. Also, just ltdtraining.com is a website. You can send, fill out an application. We'll jump on the phone with you. We do that personally. We get on the phone with you to make sure that you're a good fit for the program. We want to have touch points with every single person that is in contact with us. So we will take care of that personally. Very good. And guys and gals, if you are an entrepreneur, you have a business, you want to break through the bottlenecks and you want to break through the glass ceiling that is caused by a dysfunctional team, if you will, a team that's not working efficiently, again, ltdtraining.com or just reach out to me on DM and what I'll do is I'll connect you with either Ray or Steve and they'll kind of diagnose the business problem that you're experiencing and they'll tell you exactly how they can help you fix it so you can have the big breakthroughs and monetize your business even more. So with that said, be sure to screenshot this episode, share it on social media, tag Steve, tag Ray, tag myself, and as always, don't forget to tell your mama. We'll see you later.